I'm uh, going to call the meeting to order at 435. Um, Mandy is going to be late. Um, she's taking um, Canyon to baseball practice, I think. So um, what she had recommended was that we make a minor change to the agenda, taking item six and combining it with item eight so that those two items are presented later in the meeting. So the chair would entertain a motion to approve the agenda subject to that one change, combining item six with item eight. Is there That's a, a good motion? idea? Or do I make a motion? To I think move it? Kelly's making a motion. Oh, sure. Oh, somebody's making Somebody. a motion. Oh. I can make Anyone? it or second it either way. Um, yeah, I make a motion that, that we move number six down to number eight so that the city manager can do all of her report so at one time. You're motioning to, okay, to make that change and to approve it? Yes, please. Okay. And, and I can second that. Mm -hmm. Darcy. All in favor of approving the agenda with item six combined with item eight? Aye. Aye. It's uh, unanimous, I think, Cindy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It is. Yes. Okay, item three, public input. The public is invited to present petitions, make announcements, or provide other information to the commission that is relevant to the scope of authority of the city of Blue Lake that is not on the agenda. The commission may provide up to 15 minutes for this public input session. To ensure that each individual presentation is heard, the commission may uniformly impose time limits of three minutes to each individual presentation. The public will be given the opportunity to address items that are on the agenda at the time the commission takes up each specific agenda item. Andy. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm here, uh, Andy Jones, representing uh, Blue Lake Education Foundation, which is putting on our uh, annual fundraiser uh, later this month, Humboldt Oktoberfest in Perigo Park, Saturday, September 30. It's the Oktoberfest, is that what you said? That's right. Humboldt Hoptoberfest. Yeah, Humboldt Hoptoberfest. Uh, okay. we, uh, we took three years off from this event, but uh, it has a reputation. It's coming back. Has a reputation as a as a a properly sized, family friendly, good time here in town. Um, live music, local breweries, um, all in support of arts, music, and education, and, and athletics at Blue Lake School. Um, we have marketing. Oh, we, uh, yeah, I mentioned bands. Uh, two of the three food vendors are local Blue Lake businesses. Thank you, Darcy. We're looking forward to incorporating you into the event. Um, um, for this week's priority is is getting the word out. I mean, really, the priority for us is getting the word out um, uh, leading up to the event. Um, we have marketing in the North Coast Journal and the Lumberjack newspaper and in the donut of the uh, radio campaigns that the city has uh, sponsored. So we appreciate your support there. Um, I'm here to answer any other questions that you have about the event. What was the date again? Yes. Yeah. Saturday, September 30. Do you have Last flyers? Saturday of the month. Yeah. Do you have flyers that we could circulate for broadly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, by the end of the week, we'll have those those ready. And then how much is the gate fee? Question. Uh, tickets in advance can be purchased on our website, HumboldtHoptoberfest.net, for $35, or at the gate for $40. And does that include some samples of beer? Uh, the if you yeah for the for those who are buying a ticket, um, they get a, a commemorative glass and they get unlimited tastes during the the tasting period. Nice. What time is it? Uh, gates open at twelve thirty. Pouring starts at one p.m. The the music stops and event is over at five p.m. So the pouring starts at one. 
Pouring starts at one. That's right. And then it is all over at five. Yeah. There is a free shuttle service provided by uh, the casino that'll shuttle patrons to uh, various points in certainly Arcata, maybe McKinleyville. Um, and that'll be posted on our website in advance and at the event also. And are you still looking for volunteers? And, and this is a fundraiser for, you said? The Blue Lake Education Foundation. Okay. Okay. I got it. I already wrote it down. Uh -huh. I'm Good. so afraid of it. you got to draw, draw an arrow up to it. <laughs> uh, still, volunteers. Um, we did our first round of volunteer recruitment at school. Uh, I need to assess the number of uh, tables of you know, pouring stations that we have before recruiting pros and lulas and others. Maybe so you may that. need volunteers. Yeah. And um, any additional um, help from you, Emily, on getting the word out to the social platforms? Uh, yeah, we're, we're coming down to the crunch time there. What's the uh, attendance you'd like to reach? Uh, the goal. Yeah, I, I, I mean, a, a successful year pre-COVID was uh, 750, 800. Oh. Uh, we buy we buy a thousand glasses every year. Cool. Um, Post-COVID, you know, happy. If if we've got 500 people there who are having a great time, that's going to be, you know, a, a good, a, you know, good dusting off of the cobwebs. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'll be open. And then do you know what other food trucks or food kitchens there'll be? Yeah, the Blue Lake Pizza Company will be there and Alma's Mexican. Oops, sorry. It's a, a good combo. Yeah. 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 Sounds exciting. Okay. Congratulations on getting it back together. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you know any of the producers of the drinks? Uh, your your local favorites. I mean, we're certainly going to have Mad River there, uh, Powers Creek, uh, Six Rivers, Lost Coast, awesome. Red Curtain, Eel River, oh, cool. and uh, there will be some regional breweries represented through the distributors locally. We got a lot of beer distributors in town. Yeah, hmm. a lot of. How about the bands? Uh, the bands are. Uh, Mule Ranch. That's a Ruby Ruth's uh, mm. band. Uh, Jackie and the Jollies. And Vanderbilt. No, that would be. Fun. I feel like I've seen them some at, in my Insta feed somewhere, yeah, yeah, yeah. playing somewhere else. But and uh, bow-legged buzzards. <laughs> Gotta love it. Oh. Bow-legged buzzards. Okay. Is Andy? Is that the day that they usually have the kids go around and trick or treat? Usually in the afternoon with the businesses and things. This is September thirty. Oh, I thought it was October. My bad. Thank you. That's that because it's a hop October. October. Yeah. We. I was thinking it's October. Okay. It's October. We're oh good. Soft October. <laughs> I'm thinking this could be a really bad weekend for families. Yeah. Uh, we're really we, uh, you know, we have to navigate the conflicts with the Great American Beer Festival that a lot of local breweries or attend, and then um, you know certainly we want to not conflict with uh, the Medieval Fest as well. Right. Okay. So uh, we, strate right on. we strategically and in the winter that's when it gets busy. Around we there. strategically picked that that particular weekend. Jack, I'm glad I asked them. I got it wrong. Okay, so posters. Should be ready for distribution by the end of the week. I can drop a stack off at City Hall. Um, Definitely if, uh, bring one over to yep. to the doghouse. Great. Okay. And Good. most of you know how to get a hold of me if there's other questions. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Oh, right. Thank you, Andy. Um, yes. Ken Sawatsky and I'm here representing myself, and I like to represent common sense when I can. I attempt it. 
Uh, I'm going to report out a little bit of what happened last night's uh, public safety. I mean, that has to do with all of us here and falls within your purview. I thought you'd find some things interesting. Um, I want to thank, starting, I'd like to thank uh, Council Member McKay for being here. Uh, I think they have a problem where Chris, neither Chris Edgar nor his alternate have attended, so they have had no liaison with that particular committee. And that's, Mandy said that's going to change. They will change that. That's a good thing. It's good to have your liaison here consistently. Mm -hmm. um, some of the concerns that uh, were addressed, uh, in my opinion, and I brought up the topic of lack of communication in many forms. To give you an example, we've had a problem with RVs down along Taylor Way down there. Uh, communication was great. I was fortunate to communicate with Sheriff Billy, had a 40 minute conversation. Uh, that was one of the topics that were brought up. And 25 hours later, he emailed me, it's been taken care of, Kent. And there, have, there aren't any RVs down there anymore. So that's- They're here at the park. They're at the park. <laughs> and so, so th this, is, this is part of the problem that we need to address long-term wise. The problem is that the towing companies are not willing to tow them because it costs so much to get rid of them. So we all need to lobby to the county and the state to get money to take care of those things. The other thing that it needs to happen, in my opinion, is both all entities, and I don't think Blue Lake falls in that category necessarily, but need to develop parks for these people to park in where they can reasonably take their things there. We're going to tell you, we're going to take you to a place where you can be, you can get help, you're going to have sanitation, and uh, and maybe that'll work, maybe not. So we just try and use common sense and solve things. The other One of the other topics that uh, was addressed, and again, I brought it up because I, as some of you are aware, I do quite a few public records requests because I like to know, I'm curious. Uh, and it had to do with our tanks, our water tanks up on the hill. Uh, so I did get the grant and I got every information I need. And unfortunately, regarding those tanks, uh, there's a setback requirement of, I think, 25 or 30 feet of clear space around each tank, and then 100 foot of defensible space. That's the current thing. For current tanks, where they're going to attempt to put these other tanks in, within 10 foot of the easement. So they would need, need a lot larger footprint. And also the problem was the existing 10 foot there has brushed on it just up against the tank. And that's that's a real potential problem. Your tank catches on fire and burns. So hopefully somewhere along the line, the city will uh, get their program together and understand the the setbacks they're required and uh, and enable us to continue to have waters. If they don't, we don't. And uh, uh, we need two tanks. You need to be able to drain one, or if one fails, you're not going to lose all your water. You can lock down one and alternate. In my opinion, those two tanks should be somewhere beside each other, and that that means you only are servicing one main line up and down. Your infrastructure costs are way down. So it's just a concern, and I think all of us within Blue Lake want to continue to be able to flush toilets and take showers and things, and uh, and this needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. The uh, the Aaron McClure lease was up something like 10 years ago and has not been renewed. The city has no no way to get a grant on something they don't have the ability to put something on. So anyway, that's just some concerns that I, I felt were addressed there. And I just want to update you on some, uh, some of the things that I participate in. And a lot of it takes a request of documents to understand what's going on. So thank you for my opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ken. I have a question. So where are those tanks? Are they up on Buscombe Hill? The tanks uh, are, are up above Aaron. You know where Aaron McClure's house is? Powers Creek Ranch on the main drag. Okay. It's 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 not near you. <laughs> it's a, no, but it's it's it's, it, it, it's it's access is Buckley Road. Oh, okay. Right. Off, I I grew up and I used to play by those tanks when I was a kid. The prior tanks. Uh, the other tank is uh, on a piece of property that was used acquired uh, by eminent domain from uh, Mr. Busman. Oh, okay. And those are up on the the hill over here. Um, as you're heading up to town up on the hill. Um, so around going on the way to Corbell. Yes. Okay. So those are the two current locations. There are possible other locations, but you have lots of cost anytime you're making your, your lines and, and all your infrastructure to go. So preferably one of those two sites, and uh, they need to be greatly enlarged, whichever one you do. And in my opinion, common sense is two tanks on one lot. Okay. So is it a mandate that's... Uh, so Suggesting that there's a second tank, or is it just an idea? That's always been a function, and it, it, it is 
It may not be mandated, but it is common sense. You have redundancy. And a lot of times, if you do maintenance on one tank, you have to drain the tank completely to work on the tank. And so you need to have enough water for fire suppression and use that's locked down in the separate tanks. So I don't know of any, any uh, municipality or agencies or water districts that don't have two tanks. That's just the way they do it. So, Isn't there a reserve tank here? Yeah, there's two tanks. There's two tanks. Yes, there's one tank on one property, one tank mm -hmm. on the other, mm -hmm. I understand. And so, I don't know technically if we could pressurize our lines to somewhat directly coming out of the uh, out of the uh, municipal water, you know, where we get our water out of Ruth Lake system there. Uh, but that would only be a, I don't think it would handle the volume we would need. Blue Lake, everybody could conserve, maybe make it happen, but that's just not the way to have to store water for, for storage. So anyway, concern for all of us, and hopefully that will be addressed. Thank you, Kent. Um, there being no more public comments, I think we're moving on to item four, and that I think we need to table because we do not have minutes from the last meeting or the prior, was there a prior meeting that we were waiting on minutes for maybe? I would have to ask Mandy. Okay. So moving on to item five, the Sunday market review and discussion. Emily? So we had our market series this year with uh, North Coast growers. Um, it was much smaller and modest uh, compared to last year's with Humboldt Made. And I'd say week three or four, we had met with Keiko and a few of the other local businesses there, Del Arte, um, just getting some suggestions to the logger bar of what could be different, what could have changed to create a different drive of people out here. And there was some suggestions or conclusions we drew that there was a lot of competition with markets going on um, all throughout the summer. I know Humboldt Made runs like July through October or something. Um, and then just not having a big local draw. Um, having 10, 15 vendors is really nice, uh, but some of the people are looking for produce, some are looking for craft vendors. And so uh, curating that mix a little differently of who's there um, and having a larger event tied to it, especially with live music. Uh, those were the weeks we saw more people than DJs. Um, so we kind of moved into more of what could we do to maybe tie in with holidays or have a larger, um, shall I say, a, a touristy draw, like a tractor rides, a mini ice rink here, um, getting creative with Del Arte to have movie nights or things outside in the park that we could tie into. Um, and that's still an ongoing dis discussion with our Parks Commission. Uh, we're waiting to do a wrap up with the Growers Association the Sunday markets, um, but I think hearing what the community would like to see would be great. Um, we're putting out a new parks and rec survey coming up, so that'll likely be a question on there is if you're going to attend a market, um, when is the best time, what do you want to see, and what didn't work about this last one. Do you know how that survey would be distributed? Um, likely physically. I know I'd okay. like to look at the water and uh, maybe on the water bill, a link. Yeah, on there. Do you think maybe having it later in the, starting it later and having it go a little later? Yeah. Um, July was a big month that people said it was just too early for them or it, it caught up not too quick. Produce. Yeah, not a lot of produce. Yeah, here. Uh, yeah harvest. Yeah. Kind of a market. The harvest market oh, was more... Thank you. Oh, what people were thinking of August, September time. Mm -hmm. September and October are just stunning months here. Mm -hmm. um, have you considered having it at Perigo Park? We have. It'd be a nice space. And there could too. be maybe uh, roller skating going on or something, you know, some other draws maybe. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, kids could go. Home while the, parents well, the parents are, yeah, yeah, while well, the parents are shopping. I think that's a goal is to uh, incorporate Perigo Park and some activities over here while still trying to include our businesses in the downtown. And um, we'll be moving into town square development with that new splash pad system stuff. So trying to activate that space mm -hmm. as it mm -hmm. really um, comes together would, would be nice. But offering skating, that was something we didn't do very well this time was trying to coordinate 
things going on in the park with the market. Um, a lot of times things were happening Saturdays and the market was on Sunday. Mm. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and people did suggest too, maybe a, a weekly market isn't for Blue Lake. Maybe it's a once a month type of bigger deal. Um, that's larger and better advertised. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I have for the Sunday market. Um, the yeah, feedback I've received. Like tournament or something could be a draw, just the bocce or something. Mm -hmm. Seed it with a prize. Or... Exactly. Okay, so moving on, we were combining item six with item eight, so we'll go to number seven, the Chamber of Commerce report, which uh, I believe that is you as well. Yeah. We uh, met Monday. We have our uh, upcoming mixer this Thursday at Camp Bauer. We've invited all of our local chambers and businesses here to attend. Uh, it's 5.30 to 7 p.m. Uh, uh, commissions obviously are welcome too. It's been graciously uh, catered and sponsored by Green Diamond. So we'll have a really nice menu and uh, buck a clock. And then the promote your business type of thing for a dollar and yeah, they've gotten the facility for us, so we're looking forward to it. We had our last mixer in April, I believe, and that went well. We had about 70 people at the Grange, so we're hoping if the weather holds nicely, we'll capture the same. Uh, what time does it start? 5.30. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mandy's not here yet, so... Oh, Kent, did you... Yeah, I I will allow it. I appreciate that. You're welcome for your greatness. <laughs> Jeff Swarovski, I didn't attain, attend the chamber meeting, but I've been attending all the other meetings that we have out there. And I, I strongly approve the direction that you're going. Uh, common sense wise, uh, I think it would be best to have down here. Uh, you have restrooms down here. You're going to have the kitchen down here. You're, all of your facilities that will enable you to have all these other events combined. And I strongly you know, suggest that every two weeks or once a month kind of schedule. Um, some of the other market people, they say you consistently have to be there. We, we can bundle and schedule something where everybody shows up and Darcy can be open and we can have a couple other vendors. I think I think that I think the music and all that stuff can happen. So 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 anyway, um, be there, Darcy. Oh, um, but anyway, I, I think that that's the direction I would say to go. And I, I know we have a, a, a talk in a little while, probably on the town square project. My understanding is that uh, well, I did see the bid package and the water feature is not in the bid. It's a twenty five thousand dollar item. Uh, it's not in the bid. Um, so wait a minute. We're not talking about that right now. Well, that was brought up. That was brought up a few minutes ago. I would just follow in the lead of what was spoke on here regarding that. Okay. I, I can talk on that later. I have no problem talking on that. Okay. I think Mandy was going to talk about it too. So yeah. I mean, we may sure. sure. Well, that's fine. So I'm, I'm, well, I was just relating. We have all the facilities we need down here, including the bathrooms and things. And uh, uh, I, I just think this facility overall is more of a draw. Uh, the downtown, to be quite honest, you if you isn't really an economic draw. I mean, it's not like you have six or eight shops that are open at the same time and people at the market and going back in like you do in Arcata, places like that where, you know, people open all their businesses to go. And I think we'd benefit more from being down here than at the other location. I did take the time to talk to mm -hmm. the people at that particular thing. And of course, what, and, and observe the volume three or four times during the day. And the volume was not sufficient during the last two for people to come back. And that's the feedback I got from them. And so, unfortunately, we're going to have to entice them down to 2.0 and a, a change of venue or location, I think, might enable us to get people to come back in after their rather large disappointment as far as not being economically viable for them. Thank you. So, Mandy should be here in any minute. I think practice started at 5. You know the the um, you know, it's all kind of an experiment having the the town square um, market. Is this the second year we've done it? The second. It's the, the second, second year. year. So it's sort of an evolution of of an idea that we hope will come to fruition, and whether it's in the downtown area or or down here. I think we're on the right track of thinking maybe 
but fewer weekends yeah. for starters and maybe pushing it later in the year where we're not competing with just a myriad of things going on. And then there's going to be more, more produce towards the end of the summer as well. It was a bad year for produce. And yes, it was. It was bad in, yeah. in Willow Creek mm-hmm. when I would talk to some of them up there, and it was like it was so everything well. was late. And mm-hmm. then as far as uh, some of the stone fruit around here, it did anyone have plums? My peach tree died. Oh, well, that's... <laughs> Bear blight? No. I don't know. I mean, you probably didn't have any peaches this year? I had, oh, on my other tree, I have two. One of them was loaded, and one of them died. Hmm. Well, that's They're weird. With mm-hmm. plums, too. It's like, I would generally have a, our plum trees. We'd have quite a few. And right. this time, it was... I, I all think that I late rain. One. Oh, oh well, with the although, rain, you didn't get pollinated. Mm-hmm. Oh, although the, the pear tree at the barn is just loaded beyond belief. So some fruit really liked the year, and then the other fruit didn't so much. Our plum wasn't happy. Emily, That's how does someone sign up happy to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce? So they can either go on the sunnybluelake.com or .org, I think it's .com, um, and there's a register there either as an individual family membership or a business membership. And then it'll just automatically renew you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, or you can attend the meeting uh, the second Monday each month at 5.30 here at Skinner Store. And then they utilize PayPal. They do. Yeah. Emily, do card. can you do yeah, the Parks and Rec? Parks mm-hmm. and Rec update here? Is that? Yeah. Moving forward. Um, we're going, we have the scissor lift in Prosh Hall right now. We're going to be doing construction for another two weeks or so. Uh, we have sound baffling panels going up to reduce some of the bass and echo. Um, yeah, he's happy about that. <laughs> Tons of new lights, uh, really crazy. I've been to a lot of venues. I haven't seen anything like this up in Humboldt. Um, the lights are a little too much, so we've having to experiment lately to see the best combination. Uh, there's going to be a fogger going in there, um, so fogging stuff. Uh, the kitchen's almost done. We're getting the sinks kind of wrapped up and the plumbing to get some commercial tenants in there. Uh, we have a good selection of events coming up, the MedFest in October 7th and 8th, uh, the Logger Bar Block Party the 21st of October, 2 to 7. October what? Uh, 21st? 21st is the Logger. Um, that's just a special event permit that we put through, um, but it's the Logger Bar and Mad River and Hounds of Humboldt putting that on down on 8th Street. Uh, the BYOC Fest, uh, Low and Slow Barbecue is going to be hosting a, a day in the park, a barbecue, concert, live music, and drinks October 14th, um, featuring th- about three bands, and that's going to be 12 to 6 p.m.-ish. Do you know how much of the entry fee will be? Or I believe it'll be 20, 20. and the headliner is the poppy, California Poppies. Nice. What is BY? Oh, bring your own chair. Oh, okay. So people are encouraged to bring their own uh, chair or beanbag seating. Um, and our biggest event coming up soon, the Hoptoberfest, September 30th, our, our most soonest one, 1230 to 5. We're super excited, and I think that really will be a big day. I've been hearing a lot of chatter about it. Uh, our wood bats going to be starting up September 23rd. Um, they'll be playing for six weeks on Saturdays. Little League's going oh, to. Okay, I was trying to figure out whether that was a band. No. Wood bats. We got a lot of stuff going on. I'm just spewing it all out. Um, some things in the park that are going to change. I've added a lot of signage uh, to try to get some of these campers out. There's going to be no parking in the park now from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., I believe. Uh, and I've ordered about 30 of those signs, so they'll go all the way down on both sides here, um, and hopefully some on Taylor Way. Uh, and you have some enforcement behind that. Yeah, that allows us to have enforcement, because right now, without a sign, it's really hard to tell people to move. Um, we have also some no smoking, security camera, security camera signs, uh, playground slowing signs going up, that type of thing. When does the wood bat 
again? September 23rd. And that'll run for six weeks. Um, but we're really trying to get the park in order uh, for October time. We have a lot of big events going on. And uh, with the rink, and Darcy's had a lot of improvements done with her awning and um, a newer menu that we're going to be having put there. We'd like to do a big grand reopening of the park and have it look nice, have our new signs up. And lastly, uh, string lights and bleachers. We're going to be adding a longer set of bleachers here, a 15 foot set, um, and then a eight foot set on this side, kind of near Darcy's, and string lights up in the trees here. String lights. Yeah. It's going to be so pretty. Yeah. New bleachers. Yeah. Or extension. New bleachers. New bleachers. Yeah, lots of updates. and The uh, Mad River Enduro seemed pretty well attended over the weekend. Oh, it was crazy. Um, probably the largest one we've seen. So, it's good. I have to say, we see such an uptick at the museum when there are things going on in Blue Lake. That's great. It is. It, it's been wonderful. And a lot of folks, gee, you know, you're open, which we would like to be open more, but if no one comes in, it kind of deflates your ego. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, but no, and it's been interesting. We've had people who have history, uh, told us some things that, about a, a chair that we didn't really know about that's in there. And How cool. It's, it's great. It's great. So, people have a lot of nuggets of information. Mm -hmm. That's great. Information. Way to put it. Yeah. I wonder if that whole, you know, farmer's market thing could be on that meridian with stuff going on at the park. Farmers, in the middle. Farmers yeah. at the meridian. Yeah. The museum's open. That thing a tray. Something days. else. Like, to get up two bands. Park. One here, one there. You know, so that people are get going back and forth. Yeah. Is that too far? Along the museum strip? Yeah. yeah. I don't think farmers. Yeah. Not at all. So it's kind of steep on that. Like, just oh, the, the far side. side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had kind of a, we had some of those fruit trees that were planted there, and somebody, it was a pear tree that somebody stomped on, oh, gosh. which was kind of disheartening. Oh, good. Just be aware when you plant fruit trees around that when they drop, they attract Bears. yellow jackets. Well, this one didn't yellow. have much of, it was still a seedling. Yeah. And that was very discouraging because. Oh, yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. I thought about taping it or doing something, but oh, I couldn't God. save it. <laughs> That's sad. Well, and it was intentional. You could tell that it was intentional. So I broke it on purpose. Mm -hmm. I have one more update uh -huh. for um, families. Uh, this year, we're going to partner with Blue Lake Elementary and their PTO uh, to combine the Halloween carnival that they do uh, with the trick-or-treat around town. And to top it all off, a school dance uh, after everything. Crash Hall. At Frog. That's going to be so fun. So let me get the right date here. It's going to be Saturday, October 28th. Um, 4 to 6 p.m. is going to be the trick or treat. 5 to 7 is going to be the school carnival. Kind of overlap there. And the dance is 7 to 9 for the kids. <laughs> Will other Costume schools be invited? Dance. Yeah, all costumes. Uh, the kids' age is eighth grade and under. Um, they don't have to just be at Blue Lake, but they will need a student ID. Uh, and the cost will likely be twenty dollars. I'm thinking. They're well attended. Well, that was on a bill. Friday last year, wasn't it? Yeah, they've suggested a yeah. Saturday with uh, something going on the twenty seventh. I think. So also on Saturday, October twenty eighth, there's going to be a Halloween uh, um, gambler's choice event at the arena okay dress up on your horse and dress your horse up oh, and go through obstacles that's awesome yeah that would be a really so, fun day that means that i won't be able to be open okay or i could maybe get someone to work for me that's so, the 28th yeah what time all day yeah 10 to okay. three or something probably and it's called Gambler's Choice? Yeah, it's a series of obstacles that have a point value based on their difficulty. 
and uh, so you you have three minutes to go through as many <laughs> obstacles as you can, but you can only go through each one twice and not back to back, and then you accumulate your points. It's really fun. It sounds like it. It's super fun. It's fun to watch. Oh, it yeah. is fun to watch. Is that horses only or can you? Horses, donkeys, asses, of They're course. Horses. <laughs> I was going to that way. <laughs> There's Mandy. She is. Oh. Perfect time ish. <laughs> what a surprise. I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, New we horse. have a meeting uh, Thursday, and we'll figure out my, the budget, and then I'll see if someone wants to go shopping for prizes. I don't like to shop. I don't either. Well, Mandy, we have made our way up to item eight plus eight, six, and Emily has just given us a Parks and Rec update. Oh, great. So it's all you. We're ready for Powers Creek District and Town Square update. Uh, um, sure. The public would make comment on the Parks and Rec. So, uh, yeah, I'm very excited about the the sound conditioning in Perigo. Um, my hope is that uh, it's also considered for live music in there on the stage. Um, there are professionals who can do um, acoustical treatments too. Um, if you're looking for something other than the instructions that come with your your gear. I don't know who those people are in the community, but uh, I think it's worth uh, doing a little investigation to see if if that can overlap with what the roller rink is is doing. Um, and then I might have missed it, but did you speak to the uh, medieval festival of courage event? Yeah, you did. Okay, I October seventh and eighth. Okay, and yeah. that'll be at the arena and at the park. Yep. Yeah, okay. The park. Fairyland will be in Perigo Park, and then a midi which will be set up over by the arena. Okay. And then uh, Elizabeth's idea of using the, the strip of the museum to kind of bridge between Perigo and, uh, and the town square, to me, makes a lot of sense, especially if um, you're looking to capture family activity of, 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 of kind of the skating side versus maybe a live music side or a or a, a drink side of town. So um, I keep those ideas going. And that's also the Great Redwood Trail right there, isn't it? That's yeah. mm -hmm. that's big economic driver for Blue Lake going yeah. forward. Great. OK, that's it. Thank you. Kent. So speaking of the, the an evil thing of courage there. They know how to do their advertising. They're exceptionally good at this. And if you go on Lost Coast, there was an article yesterday in advertising where a big black bear was angry because he wasn't invited or something like that. That was funny. And they really got a kick out of that. So anytime you can get a big black bear to advertise for you, I highly recommend that we uh, maybe hire that bear on as far as um, advertising staff. Definitely. That was cute. Peanut butter on our signage, perhaps. <laughs> Bettina called me at 10 p.m. and said, look at Facebook. <laughs> Bettina didn't look at Facebook. Oh, she, yeah. Someone she gave oh. me a call. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, so, uh, Mandy, I think you're up for the Powers Creek or Town Square updates. Well, thank you for accommodating my crazy schedule today. Your family It'll be friendly. my third trip to Arcata in three hours. Um, yeah, so I wanted to give you guys an update on the Powers Creek District. Um, as you guys know, there's a lot of a lot of activity taking place um, in that area, a lot of planning, a lot of um, effort, um, master planning, um, working to install a new bike park, looking at uh, roadway improvements, economic development, housing, uh, recreation economies, the RV parking campground. Um, so lots of moving parts and uh, luckily they're moving very uh, cohesively, which is pretty exciting because that doesn't always get to happen uh, when you're looking at large scale development or at least large scale for a small town. Um, so for the RV park, I, th I think the last meeting, I kind of went over the packet, um, the development packet that will 
uh, be bringing that back to council at this next meeting for their instruction on sending that out onto the market to uh, look at um, getting some interest and some feedback from potential developers or investors on that project. Um, right now, the there's representatives from Blue Lake Power that are removing um, a lot of, well, hopefully removing a lot of the items down on the site. Um, the city has already done an assessment of the salvage value of the equipment and um, items that are left on site. And it's a really very low, um, very low return for a very high price point for removal. So the more that they can remove themselves, the more that they can go out and try and broker deals to find people to take, you know, an old coal plant that was modified for biomass. Um, it's in the city's best interest to allow them to do that. So um, they're looking at taking the old rusting uh, conveyor system, the truck dump, and some of the other equipment. Um, so that'll be less that the city will eventually have to deal with. Um, so, so that's moving forward. Um, we're also working with RCEA on potential energy development at the site, um, and that's moving forward. I had a really good conversation with Richard Engel and another rep from RCEA about uh, development potential and kind of what the thoughts were for the city as far as the RV park and also energy production and um, and potential battery storage as well. So they really liked the idea of those two projects working together. Um, they. They both have, there's a lot of synergy between, you know, recreation, um, solar, green energy, climate adaption. Um, so it's it's kind of a nice package. And so they were excited that the city had been thinking ahead in the design of the RV park and campground to, to kind of uh, sequester a, an area of the property um, for future development for energy production. Um, when we went into the project, we knew that there was some potential for that. And so we wanted to make sure that any designs going forward didn't hamper our ability to utilize that infrastructure in the future if there was um, economic opportunities there. So um, they reviewed the plans and the layout and we had a really good conversation. They're um, submitting a proposal and I think it goes in, it might be mid-month, so it's coming up, um, but it's to look at various sites in Humboldt County for uh, rural solar energy production, and so they've written Blue Lake into the proposal as well. Um, it's kind of a, an assessment feasibility study. It's through RUS, um, and it's geared towards rural communities and um, on the the level of rural that RUS deals with, we're, we're, we're pretty rural, um, very small. Um, so there's a good chance that, that that project could get funded, which would kind of start us down a path of looking at uh, implementation and, and other types of development. Um, so that's so that's kind of just all moving forward. So I don't know if you guys have any questions about that project or- I do. Yeah. Are you talking uh, like solar panels? Yeah, so it's kind of a combination project. So there's an opportunity because there's infrastructure coming in to that uh, site from the old biomass plant. So they were, you know, creating energy and then selling it, you know, out. So there's there's large scale infrastructure there um, that could also be used to purchase power and store the power in uh, batteries. But you could also do some solar projects as well and then be able to send that power out onto the grid. So there's we kind of looked at ways to. You know, when you think of a solar field, it's very dense, um, but when we looked at how solar could be placed throughout the RV park and campground, that 20 acres, there's a chance also to have maybe a larger solar array, but also then to cluster solar in the RV park itself. Um, and there's, you know, opportunity with new vehicles coming on. Eventually, there's going to be electric RVs and stuff even. So looking at ways to integrate some of that infrastructure into the design of the RV park, there could be even solar at each RV site. And so by the time you kind of take that in totality, maybe you gain a couple hundred extra solar panels just dispersed throughout the park as well. So the development opportunity for solar is fairly large. Um, it's got good Southern exposure. It's good open space. Um, 
you know, we had looked at the site originally for just blanketing the whole thing with solar, but the return for the city was pretty minimal. Um, obviously, it's the return to the environment is big, but the return to the city for economic development was very minimal. So um, the RV park and campground has a better economic potential, but it doesn't mean that one precludes the other. So we're just really looking at ways to integrate both and kind of maximize the potential of both. So would this be a revenue generator for the city in some way? Just yeah. Yeah. Power? So it's, you know, it's like your solar panels at home, you know, if you're, you're net metering and then you're sending back. So you're either offsetting the cost of development. Um, if you do it as a micro grid, then there's opportunity to sell that power back for profit. Um, so it can be kind of a combination of both. Um, so yeah, just that would be part of the feasibility study too, is just to really look at what the economic potentials are and what's the best way to develop it and package it. Is so. there some resiliency benefit if like there's a power outage? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where maybe your battery storage maybe mm -hmm. comes into play. And I'm not exactly sure, you know, when you're looking at, an economic development project versus a resiliency project, mm -hmm. you know, like how, how do those, um, you know, if the, if the grid needs the power, then they're going to take the power first versus mm -hmm. being able to say, Oh, wait a minute. We don't want to send it to the grid. We want oh, to like, keep it for ourselves. So. We're not in the, tied with the grid. Yeah. So I think that, you know, you just have to kind of look at that structure. Um, but there's always the opportunity to build in additional resiliency. And that was really part of the grant when we wrote for the EDA grant for to look at the RV park and campground and looking at transitioning our economy to something that was more resilient, um, the funding came from the 2019 disaster fund. And we specifically wrote into that application, the city's need to look at an economic foundation that was less impacted by natural disasters. And that's why we got funded. So we said, you know, we had the timber industry, you know, we have all, we had these very, um, intense natural resource-based economies, but over the years, those have all been impacted on one way or another. It can be wildfire, it can be, you know, floods, it can be um, infestations of, you know, pests. It can, you know, there's a whole host of things that impact those industries, just our roads themselves. So, you know, we recognizing that, you know, every time a road is shut down, that's a transportation route that impacts industry. And so we were able to kind of sell this story that we were looking to be more resilient and diversify our economy to something that was less impacted by those um, types of events. And so looking at recreation, um, that was, you know, the focus and the RV park and campground was kind of the anchor and so EDA liked that, and it was very much a resiliency platform that we wrote it from. So. We'll look at Crescent City. They mm -hmm. just came back up on power Sunday. Yeah, from those fires. Yeah, really. Yeah, they've yeah. been they've been running that whole town's been running on generators. Yeah, for, that main what, transmission three weeks, line was two impacted. and a half weeks. Yeah, I didn't yeah. Know that. it's I mean it's a long time down. Yeah, and so when you're larger, of course, but mm -hmm. that could easily be us. Absolutely. Uh, I, I have a question about another project that was proposed. It's not in the city, but on Hatchery Road. What happened on that one? Yeah, so I had talked with RCA about that. You know, I had a lot of concerns about that project originally because we had been working with various partners to look at more development in that area for recreation, specifically um, access to the river to be able to put in drift boats for steelheading, um, access to the river just for people that want to go to the river um, in the summer, and then um, access for mountain biking, parking, and possibly even kind of hip camp type uh, camping in that area, you know, working with some of the private property owners to see if that would be of interest, um, you know, developing some dry camping areas where, you know, if you have a sprinter van or whatever, you'd be able to stay in that area. Because we really need to, you know, we're bringing in a lot of people, but we're just not capturing all the dollars potential that each one of them represents because we don't capture them, you know, they don't stay here, you know, there's not enough places for them to spend money. So we had been working with the county and Green Diamond and RCMBA and everyone on this whole plan. And then all of a sudden they were like, oh yeah, well, there's this solar project <laughs> that was, you know, it's like, wait a minute, we were... We were working on a project here. So 
we had some concerns just about how those two kind of integrated. Um, and it's my understanding that it's, um, I think the cost, what I had heard was that the cost of construction had gone, gone way up. Um, supply chain issues were a big issue. And I think ultimately the project was not maybe penciling um, as it did when they first started. I mean, we're seeing the cost of construction has, you know, it, it's through the roof right now. I mean, things are so expensive. So things that you modeled maybe three years ago, now, you know, add, I mean, you might have to add 40 to 50% or more to that project budget. So at some point, you know, it, it starts to not balance out. So well, I'm um, sure the neighbors will not be disappointed. <laughs> I don't think any <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I get it. It's hard because it's, you know, like it is great and it's, you know, it's the direction we need to go, but there's certain spaces that you go, oh gosh, but just not right there. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of older industrial sites that have a lot of good exposure as well. Maybe already have the infrastructure coming in. That just seemed like a very challenging well, site. The site that was talked about was over the old Corbell site. Oh yeah. Drive yeah, in. absolutely. That to me, it seemed to make a lot of sense yeah. since it's not being utilized. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of space at the old mill site in Corbell that could be, you know, turned into solar, which would really help offset the cost for the mill, too. And I know that they are looking at that. Um, you know, we talked with, uh, oh, we just call him Young George. <laughs> so, you know, he's he's in charge of looking at renewables and stuff. So I know that that is a part of their portfolio. The Great Redwood Trail Agency is going to be looking at river access tie-ins yeah. to the trail, too, for yeah. their, however they, their, I think it's grant-making funding that they're looking at. And they're yeah, I'm clustering. really excited about that project. I pushed really hard and advocated really hard for the economic analysis, you know, as part of that, because I said, you know, we're, we're looking at all, we look at the environmental side and we, and all of this, but the economic side is huge. And the nice thing about the Redwood, the Great Redwood Trail is there's a lot of opportunity to replicate. So, you know, as you're moving down a trail, you know, if you're doing able to do, it's like the PCT, you know, mm -hmm. if you're able to do however many miles you can do, you're going to need some of those same amenities when you get to your end point. So you're going to need a place to stay. You, you know, you need some food, you might supplies. need supplies, you know, maybe your bike is broke. So a lot of the amenities, you know, for each community could be replicated uh, and we don't have to compete, but we're just showing the capacity of the trail to, you know, to carry all of those user groups. So um, it's, I think it's pretty exciting, especially for small communities, because we don't need a ton of development to, to stabilize ourselves and to be successful. We just need stable development and investment and things that are also palatable to the community. So recreation, those types of amenities, you know, if you had a little bike shop or you had, you know, another restaurant or things, those are all things that the community can benefit from as well. So, so I don't know if you have any more questions on that project or thoughts or questions. I'm just curious mm -hmm. if um, they'll definitely leave that, uh, the connection. <clears throat> The connect oh, at the, the like power. yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff that's been stripped out, um, but the main infrastructure coming in is I don't think there's there's not any value to try and take out any of that in ground infrastructure, so it's really kind of the low hanging fruit. Um, you know, there's they're not going to spend time and resources on something that's you know doesn't have value, so it's mostly the stuff that they can get. There's another plant, uh. I want to say it's over towards maybe Woodland um, that has a similar type of operation. It's one of the last ones. And so they always need spare parts. So that's, I think that's where most of it's going. It's, you know, most, some of it will be junked, um, but they're going to try and get as many parts out of things as possible and, and get rid of the rest. So there's really no value at all in scrap metal right now. And the scrap metal, it hasn't had much value for a number of years. So um, like I said, when we did the assessment uh, to look at what it would cost us to clean that whole site, it was it was between eight hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars. So the more we can let them take and take on that burden is, you know, it's better for us in the long run. And then the other comment that I've been to some parks up in Washington where they've put solar on top of all of the 
any parking area, right. any kind of roof. And yeah. it was just, well, I thought, wow, this is a really good use. Yeah, they were really excited to see the development plan. And like I said, we don't know that that's the development plan that will come to fruition. You know, it was, the work was done to set a vision and to look at, to have something I'm sorry, to focus on, um, you know, to look at the economics and run the performas. Um, but it could, you know, that design could change, you know, it could, it could morph, it could, you know, maybe someone will look at it and be like, oh my gosh, this is great. You know, I'd like to do something exactly like this, but looking at the potential for solar installations throughout that whole development, there was, you know, huge opportunities. Mm -hmm. So they were really interested and really liked, you know, that concept and thought that that would play well. Also, I think it's a great application. Honestly, I've, I've worked with RUS for years. I did a pretty large scale power line extension project for the Yurok tribe. And so I wrote for RUS funding. I think I had three cycles of funding from them and it's, you know, multi-million dollar funding and they really like creative approaches um, and especially when it helps small communities. So being able to, to show how solar can help you know, development, offset costs, increase economics, creates jobs, makes you more resilient. It's a, it's the whole package. And so you can really sell a really good story around it. Um, does the public have any comments, Ken? So regarding the uh, hatchery project down there for the solar, I tracked that uh, quite, quite extensively. I was one of the few people who actually spoke against the project at the meeting. I did not recall having uh, city participation as far as physically going to the meetings. I spoke to John Ford on the topic today regarding that. Uh, close to a year ago, I was within one vote of them getting a one-year extension and no more, uh, basically. That will be coming up again for renewal in some time. And I hope would hope at that time I would get support from the city to go ahead and make sure that either that project was put to bed at that time or it was one year renewal or no more. Um, in my opinion, it was a, a terrible project and never should have even been envisioned. Uh, and I, I think uh, uh, working with uh, with our the head of our uh, safety committee down there, who's down at the hatchery all the time, mm -hmm. he and I were working together to make sure that that didn't happen. Of course, Winnips went ahead, leased the land. My opinion was these people were only headhunters. The project was too small a project for them to market to somebody else. And it was, I think, five or six years ago. And if they were really going to have done that project, they would have done it within a year or so. So I think that COVID and price increases really isn't a factor. I just think it was a bad project. And at the same time, I was talking to them on the phone saying, I've got locations, like you said, Corbell, fantastic brownfields in the Hoopa area, way better sun, and they have what you need to have. Now, regarding your solar, uh, what's the, the organization up there at Humboldt Shots Energy did major assessments. And of course, they came out with all of the main areas like we have where you used to have a mill, because like you mentioned, that's where they can hook up and you have the infrastructure. And uh, and of course, my my 16 acres was assessed uh, because they couldn't get it on Kernan's property, but down in the valley down there, and it, it did not compute as far as as far as a solar project, just because it had shading from the power lines that go across there, the major lines. Small things like that make these things not feasible. And of course, they went with the one then, I think out at the, the airport down at the McKinleyville is the one that shots mm -hmm. kind of concentrated on. So I am tracking the solar, uh, and I, I would hope we'd have, we would have a support to put that one to bed out there when that comes forward. If you do have, have questions, uh, and I did, like I said, I talked to John Ford. I said, John, can we just kill it this time? Because, and, and he said, well, maybe we'll see what we can do. So when the time comes, if I'm informed that's up there, I would appreciate city coming up with a letter of support to put that one down and, and repurpose for what, what's been said here. It's, it's a fantastic, beautiful place. And it was kind of an insult to mother nature that thing ever got permitted. Um, so I think that's kind of kind of my part on the solar part. Thank you, Kent. Uh, my recollection is that the city did write a letter um, and a lot of times letters are letters, and when you come out there with four or five people speaking directly to the planning commission, that's when I've had my luck. Letters are just in a packet. There may be 50 letters for, 50 letters against, and yet it's it's the personal touch that makes these things uh, go. And I, I strongly recommend you send send a group of people and to speak on it. You know, you have 
five people who speak and, and uh, you're, you're countering five people who say we have to have solar anywhere we can, no matter what. And I understand that concept, but there's certain places that, and that was, I think the 350 people went over the top of us and along with support from Mike Wilson for the project and, and some other people who were, were into the totally renewable energy at that, that. Maybe you could remind us when those- I will be happy to do so. And I, I, I'll ask John Ford to trap that for me and then we can show up and, and have a little more comments. So sure. I think I'll leave that one. I've had my share on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Which I believe this brings us to the town square project update. Yeah, I'll just um, wrap up kind of the Powers Creek. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, just so you guys know. So the Bottawak Community Project is moving forward. Um, they're finishing up their CEQA work. Um, that'll be going to the Planning Commission. We also submitted our housing element to HCD um, for final review, and they've acknowledged that they have it. It's in review. Um, it should be a fairly straightforward process um, to receive their approval so that that can be taken back for Council's consideration of adoption. Um, that's been a lot of work, and um, it's uh, it's it's great to see it come come to kind of a closure and um, for the city to be, you know, very close to compliance finally. And it opens up a lot of doors and a lot of funding opportunities, um, a lot of project opportunities. So uh, Gary Reese, our city planner has been carrying, really carrying the burden on that project. And it's, like I said, it's been a lot of work. Uh, we were really lucky to be able to receive um, some grant funding. We received some uh, LEAP funding and some REAP funding. And those uh, funding sources allowed us to uh, pay Gary um, to be able to write the housing element, do all of the uh, compliance work, and um, be able to take that through multiple iterations and reviews by the community and the planning commission and um, look at the environmental side of that and then um, facilitate those dialogues with HCD um, to, to work towards compliance. So um, that's... That's been exciting, and I can't wait for that project to finally be be done. Um, the northern that, side of the timeline ish kind of a thing, or um, I think they have a sixty day review, um, which hopefully can go faster since they've seen it. This is the sixth version or something we've sent, so we've gone back and forth a number of times, and uh, mostly it's you know just to address their comments. We take it, make it the revisions, take it back out for comment implement, you know, integrate comments where appropriate and then send it back. So um, they've seen our draft numerous times and um, hopefully we're at the finish line. So, um, the northern side of Taylor Way master plan and parcel subdivision, um, that is a project that we are uh, utilizing the remainder of our EDA funding to complete that work. Um, that is, um, and we're actually just waiting for EDA to give the final approval. Um, we've kind of figured out that maybe our EDA rep only works maybe once a month or <laughs> quarterly. We're not sure. Um, we can't seem to ever get a hold of her. And then all of a sudden she shows up and and we get a lot of a lot of correspondence. So I'm not sure if she's like rotating through programs or what the deal is. It No, it's Winnie. Okay. Um, yeah, I was about, re I might call Melinda and just see if. She's pretty responsive. I know, and she's, yeah. Melinda's been great. She's always such an advocate for um, for small communities. Um, but yeah, Winnie, and Winnie's great too. We just, she just tends to disappear. We can't find her. So um, we have lots of emails and lots of calls in um, trying to get that request. But she had granted, basically granted us the extension so that we could use the remaining funds. Um, and so the remaining funds are proposed to be used to finish kind of a master plan with Storyland, looking at the remaining parcels across on the northern side of Taylor Way and looking at how they connect um, to the RV Park and Campground Project and then also doing the parcel subdivision. Um, so that basically, we basically have three large lots out there that need to be subdivided up so that they're more developable, but part of that is deciding how to divide those up and what makes the most sense when you look at connectivity and you look at ingress, egress, and utilities and emergency access and development capacity, you want to make sure that you're creating parcels that make sense um, and have enough carrying capacity for development. So that will be something that Storyland will help us do. Um, they're really good at looking at space and and coming up with a vision and kind of translating that into something that's uh, manageable for us to to kind of wrap our brains around. 
Um, so that's ongoing. And then the Taylor Way Master Plan and Road Improvements, that is the project with, um, we received some funding from the Humboldt County Association of Governments, HCOG, and we've hired Dan Burden, who is kind of the walkability expert guy. Um, he's really great to work with, but his uh, his areas of expertise are really looking at walkability um, and functionality of road systems. So when you look at the how a road system facilitates multiple user groups safely and effectively and efficiently. And Taylor Way is one where we have um, a very wide landscape. Um, we have varying degrees of user uh, groups. So you have recreationists, you have industry people, um, you have you know, uh, commercial users. Um, so just kind of a whole host of user groups. And so we need to make that roadway safe for everybody. Right now it's just two giant lanes, straight stretch. It's like the biggest drag strip in Blue Lake. And, you know, if, if it was a drag strip, it'd be great, but it's not. And so we now need to look at that and see what improvements need to be made so that everyone can safely navigate that space, especially with the um, with bike park going in. Um, looking at connecting the spaces. So if we do have development on the north side and the south side, how do people make their way across to each development safely, um, whether that's crosswalks or roundabouts or different um, different installations. So that work is ongoing. And I just did the same presentation of public safety last night. Um, Dan is also looking at some of our, some of our other uh, concepts through our local road safety plan in Blue Lake, and he's going to be doing kind of an assessment and a report. And so I'll be able to bring that report back to economic development as well. So you can kind of get a feel for what he's recommending. Um, he's looking kind of at, you know, the future of Blue Lake, like what our focus is for usership, um, but also looking at functionality and facilitation of current user groups as well. So I'll be able to bring that back um, to this Dan's group. What's Dan's last name? Dan Burden. B-U-R-D-E-N. -E Burden. Thank you. Yeah, so that's kind of the wrap up on Powers Creek. If you guys have any questions, I know, um, did you talk about the Enduro race that we had down there? We touched on it. Okay, we yeah, so, so that was, um, you know, we so we had the enduro over the weekend, and we had a ton of participants. And Taylor Way was full on both sides of the street. If we had had an RV parking campground, we would have made mm -hmm. an incredible amount of money. Um, but it really shows the interest in recreation in our community. Um, I think Gina said they had about twenty five percent of their ridership was from out of state. Um, so each year that interest is growing, which is really exciting. Um, and that that's an event that has a lot of capacity to grow and to, um, you know, increase. Um, so it, the Enduro itself could be a two-day event eventually. Um, there's opportunities to have more Enduro events. Um, we different professional types. photographers up here taking pictures. Then, then those pictures yeah. get out. It's going to be, the word will be out. Yeah, it's a pretty incredible event. It's very well ran. Um, it's a great partnership between the city and RCMBA. Um, they're really good to work with. You know, they, um, they, they're very community focused, um, but it's, it's another opportunity to build recreation economy for Blue Lake. And so these partnerships are really critical, um, but it was really interesting to see Taylor Way transform itself <laughs> into like, you know, a mountain biking, like, you know, it really did become a mountain biking RV park at mm -hmm. that point. I have a question about the, um, the RV park, the proposed RV park um, and Storyland. Uh, project is that a two phase thing? So, because the RV park is definitely a great idea and is going to be used by you know a lot of people, so is that going to go in first? And then the maybe the swimming pool and the convenience and all that is that a like a second phase? Yeah, so what we're proposing to do is to put the whole project out on the market and to see what type of development interest it garnered. And someone could come in and say, you know what, I really like this project. 
I'd like to do something. I'd like to do this project. I'd like to do the 22 project, project. or I would like to propose a smaller project or a piece mm -hmm. of the project, mm -hmm. or I'd like to do this portion of the project, but would be interested in working with someone else who maybe wants to do the, the little motel or a different aspect. Maybe it's a um, events um, developer who wants to do the event center area. Um, so we don't really know. Uh, but the the idea is to get the project out on the market and show that Blue Lake has the capacity and we have the interest and we have the land and kind of see what the market tells us back. Um, if we get it out there and people look at it and say, oh, it's it's too too much, it needs to be phased or it could be. I mean, we could actually get people saying it's not dense enough. You should get you know, you could get more RV sites in there. Um, we just don't really know. Um, but the goal was to take a project that we felt was manageable, run the performas, look at the projections, look at the costs associated with development and see if it penciled out. And from the analysis that they were able to do based upon cost of construction, uh, you know, and the uh, performance of the the development itself, it's got a good return. So it's it's a pretty viable project. There's a lot of money on the market right now for recreation development, especially RV parks. Um, I was just reading a report last quarter um, about RV park development and investment. And what's happened is there haven't been a ton of new RV parks built. Um, it's, you know, you need a big piece of land. It needs to be connected to, you know, to facilities where people are coming in. So there's not a ton of space to develop these and where they're, you know, so there's a lot of older parks on the market, but those parks haven't had the facelift, you know, they're, they're kind of at, it's like your roof, you know, they're at their 25 year useful life and they need, yeah. So everything needs to be upgraded. And so there's a lot of investors out there right now that are, they're kind of gobbling up some of the older, smaller mom and pop parks, and they're having to put a lot of, um, cash into them to redevelop. And then there's a lot of interest on new park development as well. So uh, it's a it's a growing industry. It's not projected to decline for many years. Um, so there's a good chance that we'll, you know, that we'll get some that we'll get some interest and we'll get feedback. And like I said, we'll see if we're on track or not. It's but it's really a market. It's a great idea. Do you know the KOA too. in between Arcata and Eureka put in a swimming pool? Oh, they do. Nice. I think they put in a swimming pool. Yeah. And they have a like a nice gift store store thing. And Well, they're yeah. not at KOA anymore, though. Yeah, I heard that. They're oh. privately owned. Oh. Is that owned by Schneider? Yeah, Travis yeah. owns that. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. I just, when we were looking for places to put John's trailer, mm -hmm. it was like really expensive. Yeah, it's and then very incredibly expensive. All this work. Oh, it is. But mm -hmm. then during COVID, you couldn't buy a trailer. You couldn't even buy so one. So all those yeah. people that bought travel trailers mm -hmm. and had their kids doing school down the road are now looking for things to do. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a viable thing. Yeah, and it's a, you know, it's nice. We've had four events. Uh, this is our fourth enduro, and each year it gets bigger, but each year we are able to accommodate it. And so, you know, we're getting a lot of feedback just from, you know, kind of bootlegging this project. You know, it's, we don't have all the facilities, but we're seeing, you know, with what we have, you know, what are the impacts? What are the needs? You know, what are the bikers telling us they'd like to have? Um, and so we're getting a lot of really good information and data back um, from these events as well. So um, it's pretty exciting. Thanks. Town Square. Okay. So did we talk about Town Square? Was there something? I'm sorry, but no, not yet. Mm -hmm. Comment. Ken. No. My understanding was that part of the deliverables from Storyland was they were to do a feasible feasibility study. And from what I said, that's been completed. Mm -hmm. And if possible, could we, and I'm not supposed to ask her a question, I'm supposed to ask you to ask her a question. That got, so could you ask her if it's possible that that be put on the city website so all of us have access to that feasibility study? I think if it's to be marketed out there, you know, 
those of us who are going to be part of this thing to be able to see how feasible it actually is. And I did want to make comment that uh, Travis Schneider's name was brought up a while ago, and Travis Schneider's acquisition team, a uh, realtor by the name of Tina Christian, approached me regarding uh, Schneider's interest in the park, and I was informed by staff that the city was not interested in having Mr. Schneider participate at that time, or at all, is my impression. So um, when it comes down to... Yeah. to correct. Okay. And so anyway... Uh, you know, I deal with people who do major investments down in Mexico, down there. They have probably, they had probably 10 RV parks all in the beach area called Kino, Mexico. And all but two of those are totally abandoned at this time. And we're repurposing those for other purposes. I'm not saying it's not going to happen and it's not going to continue to grow. But if you look at the research at what's happening because of cost, I think the RV parks down in Mexico are able to be rented in the middle of winter and it's 72 degrees in my properties right by the beach down there. And we we can rent those things for probably 30 cents on the dollar if people want to come down there. That's my, my rental thing for housing that I'm able to do. I'm just, I'm just saying I'd like to see the feasibility study, and I'm happy to get that out to other people. Since Mr. Schneider's not on the list. Other people who may be interested in investing. And it's always nice if we can get a local firm in here that already knows the local market and has a tested thing. There are other people out here who possibly could be approached. Chant, why do you think that the uh, RV parks in Mexico failed? I can't say why. They were wonderful parks. Maybe... Was it, it people from California yes. driving that far with their and, and RV? Part Maybe it didn't turn out to be a great idea. Down with RVs. Who, who liked it there, bought their houses 25 years ago. So now they go down and they live in their house right on the beach. So they liked it so much that the, the that particular crowd that was interested, it, my understanding, it will be marketed, it will be developing again down there to, to an extreme. Uh, I don't know about RVs, but I'm, I'm my property values down there, what's happened here is pathetic compared to the return down there as far as people wanting to buy the houses. People... Uh, RVs are, are really nice, but, but you really don't see as many people. Other people are afraid of going down because of potential cartel problems at the border. We have none. This is this is the safest place in Mexico, right? But th that's just a constraint, and I'd like to see the feasibility study. I think we all would. And then then uh, all of us, you know, who, who have ability to reach out to people who do, you know, multi-million dollar investments, 20 million, these guys kind of, that's what they do. So thank you for the opportunity to ask that question. I have you asked that question. Kent has asked if the feasibility study is available online or will be. Available. So once it's fully um, it's being... reviewed and we have a final draft, it'll be released. Okay. Yes, eventually. Okay. Do you have a timeline for that, Rosie? I do not know, but um, I know the grant timing is probably has some stipulations to, but it has to be out by a certain period yeah we have and to get direction from council to be able to release it as well so we'll present it to council um, possibly at this meeting in september um, to you know basically ask council if they want us to release it out onto the market so at that point we'll we'll um, go forward or we'll bring it back and um, make any revisions um, to the project if necessary Okay, so, and so the last thing we have under this agenda item is the town square project update if there's yeah um so the town square project went out to bid and we've closed those bids we received um two qualified responsive bids um the low bidder was sequoia construction um the bids came in uh, higher than our budget. We were pretty prepared for that. Um, when we wrote the grant a number of years ago, costs were very different than they are today. Um, but the way we designed the project, um, we specifically designed the project to have some ability to have deferred installations or phased development. Um, the biggest cost driver was the bathroom. Um, the we spec a Portland Loo, which apparently is the most expensive um, single toilet unit Extreme you can. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like one hundred ninety thousand dollars, <laughs> which I was like, you could build. Do you could build, toilet you could build a house with two bathrooms with in it? Yeah. Local business just down the street. Yeah, right. So um, we were we were pretty prepared for that to come in higher than our budget. Uh, and so we've been working with uh, Sequoia to look at some uh, reductions and um, some deductions from their bid. 
Uh, we've also met with USDA to talk about their community facilities program, which is a kind of over-the-counter uh, grant application that can be sourced through our local rep. Um, so our local rep brief has um, he's been really supportive of Blue Lake. We've received several grants um, from him to help out with like the commercial kitchens, and um, he's he's helped out with the Grange roof. Um, just very supportive of the smaller communities and just he really likes the projects where he can, you know, look at like how, you know, 15 to $50,000 can really make a big impact for a small community. So um, we have the capacity to write for a community facilities grant for up to $50,000 for a bathroom. It's an allowable project because it helps to facilitate farmers markets. And so that's one of their um, one of their components of their community facilities program. Um, so we're. We're not too concerned that we won't have a bathroom. We'll we'll end up with a bathroom at some point or a modified version of uh, what originally we had looked at. So, um, so that project will be. I should be signing that notice of award this week. Um, we'd like to get Sequoia in prior to the rains. It's a pretty small project. Um, the town square is not. You know, it's not a big landscape. Um, and the installations are are fairly minor. Um, one of the things that we do need to get in is our PG&E application, um, and that can take quite a while. So there's a possibility of getting into construction and then buttoning up for the winter and then finishing up in the spring because we'll probably be on that timeline for PG&E anyways. Um, the project will include a splash pad for the kids. Um, it'll include a trellis uh, style shade structure. It'll include, we're trying to put um, a couple of solar lights up, kind of the more historical looking lights that you can hang the, you know, the flower baskets from. Um, it will include some paving, um, stamp concrete. Um, we need that for the surface for the splash pad. Um, there's a portion of the site that um, along the creek that will stay grass um, because eventually we're going to have to peel back the the um, sidewalls of the creek that are failing. And the plan is to kind of peel that back similar to the other side of the street by the post office and honeycomb. So that instead of having this big defining structure, um, that's very, you know, uh, confined, it'll be more of a natural state. And then it becomes kind of a feature of the town square as well. Um, so that's part of the design consideration as we knew that we needed at least 25 feet set back in that area. So we're not, you know, um, building something and then having Tearing to tear it out. So um, it also is designed to have a um, placeholder for the holiday tree. So they've designed kind of a an in-ground box um, that will allow the holiday tree to be um, placed and uh, kind of tightened down and anchored, um, including electrical coming up for the lights. Um, Can it get watered? What's that? Can it get watered? Yeah, we actually have watering as part of the project. So there's some, um, there is irrigation as part of the project. Um, the the shade structure came in uh, pretty expensive, came in at about $33,000, um, but North Fork Lumber has offered to donate the materials for the shade structure, which is great. Um, and so we're looking at you know, ways to kind of reduce that price down a bit. Um, uh, we've talked with Sequoia about them putting the footings in and getting it ready for installation and maybe having it as a community project. Um, we'd already talked with um, the Crows and some of our other volunteer groups previous to um, putting this out to bid about some of the aspects of the project that might lend themselves to more community installations. Um, I know we have marked space for a community bulletin board that Mr. Um, Mr. Jones, Art Jones, has really push for, um, and that will be kind of a nice community project as well. So um, we'll get a really nice project out of it. I don't know how far we'll get this part of the season. Um, it just depends. We're getting varying degrees of projections on predictions on the weather. Um, if, you know, if it hits early, we, you know, we'll, we won't get as much done. If it hits later, uh, you know, we'll transition, get as much done and then transition over into the spring. So, um, yeah, I can't. Um, I um, it seems like when I'm picturing the toilet, 
by the bus stop. It seems like that's going to be the feature. And I'm wondering if that has to be where the bathroom is or could it be pushed closer to the garage, the old house? Yeah, so the problem with the bathroom is you have to have an ADA accessible path of travel, mm -hmm. including your access from a parking space. So it really kind of hampers our ability to make that placement. So that area by the um, bus stop and the water fountain is the best area for us to bump out for the ADA accessible sidewalk. So I'm wondering if maybe some lattice work or something uh, uh, attractive could be built around it so it doesn't look like you come to the park and it's the Lou Park. Yeah. And you know, honestly, if we, I think if we got the Portland Lou, they're actually really cute and you can also have them wrapped. So you could actually have those wrapped in a mural or an art piece. Mm -hmm. um, some of them come with ways where you can actually put, you know, event posters and things. They're actually not that bad. I don't, have you seen the one in Arcata? from by the um yeah. crabs feel it's pretty when, they're real small where it's gonna open up i mm -hmm. mean you you want to have it maybe the door towards the street and yeah. not towards the group of people that are picnicking right <laughs> no it opens towards the street right yeah. well for ada it would have yeah, to it has open to, open to the, street the street for ada yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, just the little it, things. Love yeah. It. yeah. The, like you talked about the paving stones mm -hmm. and things. Is there uh, going to be like an opportunity for maybe people to buy a paving stone and have it engraved? Yeah, we talked Something about like that, that as part of maybe an art piece. Um, the paving will actually just be stamped concrete mm -hmm. um, because we need that grade for the water feature so that, you know, when the kids are using the splash, um, the splash area, the water actually flows back into the wastewater system. Um, and that's a lot harder to get trying to do it without it being poured concrete. Um, and it's a pretty small space, but I think there's a lot of opportunity um, to, to do some art installations and things. The problem with the site is it's just so small. And the more we put in, the less capacity we have to utilize it. So we've tried to keep it pretty minimal and open um, that way we can do farmer's markets, we can do pop-up music events, we can do the holiday tree and things, because um, it's it's pretty small to work with, but it's a beautiful site. Um, I think in the future, you know, the glass blowing shop, you know, it, there's a hundred different things that that site could do um, to change and, and you know, um, coexist in the area yeah. in a better fashion. Um, and we've been in talks with the property owner and now the administrator for since we started this project about their property and what happens when this town square goes in. Um, one of the reasons why we didn't want to do anything down at the end that you were talking about is because that's a really great location for a food truck. So when we designed the town square, we designed it specifically to interface with a potential food truck in their driveway so oh, nice. they could lease their space out for a food truck use their electricity and then people are walking it on the town square where you could have little bistro tables and things and so people are eating there and then you know it's you know they're just interacting but it creates an opportunity for us to help that property um be better is that me yeah I'm glad it's just Glenn. We just have a water leak behind. Oh. Um, so we tried to kind of think about all those uses. The shade structure, um, we chose the, we worked with the Arts and Heritage Commission to look at what kind of shade structure would be the most appropriate. And it ended up being the kind of the trellis structure with the vines seemed to be a nicer fit because it didn't preclude any other uses um, you know having a covered shade structure it really just shuts down yeah. the the site and it doesn't allow um, multi-functional uses like the holiday tree so we were trying to look for something that had that kind of shade structure facility but it could also serve as a block to the the other property while leaving kind of the front part open. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea was to build the trellis, you could have some really nice vines and plantings and flowers connected with it. So it blocks it, but it's it's also, you know, in the future, if that site transitions and, you know, and is better than it is today, mm -hmm. we might want to have more of a connection to it as well. So um, 
just, just kind of left it a little bit more flexible. Um, so are there any more questions or public comment? Kent, I'm gonna, uh, we're, I'm watching the clock here, so I'd, I'd like you to try to stick to three minutes if possible. I will attempt. Uh, I did a public record request on this one. I'm in construction. That's what I do. So I spoke to Tim Hooven and also to the other bidder on this thing. And that there were some major problems with the bid package. We won't, I won't waste my time on those. Um, if you look at the bid, if it was to be, if the Lou was to be dropped out of the bid entirely, according to the specs that I saw there, Mr. Hooven's bid would have been $72,000 less than the other bid. In my opinion, it should have gone back out to every in everybody's best interest to take the low number at that time without that in there. Um, I do concrete work. I probably poured and done thousands of yards of concrete work during my life. And uh, this particular project, the stamped concrete, in my opinion, is not really a rural thing. Um, it's six inches thick and you can easily get by with a four inch pour uh, three H rebar, 24 inches on center and go to a six sack mix instead of five. And your strength is there. There's no reason to have this project overbuilt. I don't have a clue why it was or why stamped was used rather than a whole bunch of other alternatives. Um, I'm kind of disillusioned in that the, the particular project appears to have two thirds of what my opinion should be like we have out here in grass is now paved, it's concrete. Yeah. And, and, you know, kids, adults, dogs, everybody likes to lie on grass and be part of a park thing. It just did, it, The whole plan didn't make too much sense. I have the current sketches that were done by by um, here in Plenty. I just got those today, and I haven't even had time to look at those. Mm -hmm. Allegedly, the project followed her design work, but I, I, I will have to look and see about that. I'm, I'm quite distressed about the project itself, and, uh, and this is what I do. In talking to Mr. Hooven, uh, they've done bathrooms before, not the Portland Loo, and if I recall, they were like forty or forty-five thousand dollars to have a bathroom that's functional and has all everything you need to be acceptable. So there are all, all kinds of other options to this, and I just wish that um, wish that they'd been explored and, and a little bit more of a follow through with the people. The question I would like you to ask uh, your staff is: um, it, Is the poplar tree going to be removed from here that the children love to play in? Prior to other shade trees coming up to a, a height where they can have shading, uh, you know this this is this is a, in me it's, it's a feature that we already have there it should stay as long as possible. The kids love to play in it, and uh, and that would be a question. And then also in this bid package, I did not see the water feature, which is 20, 20 or twenty five thousand in the bid package. So I guess that's to be done separately or something else. There was no designs for this, and there were no elevations done by your staff. In other words, you can't look at a picture and say, hey, this is what it looks like from all four sides. And that to me is what you folks need. I can work off of plans, but it sure would be nice to have had pictures so you could actually see what it looks like by a, a competent architect. Thank you for an opportunity to speak on this topic. Thank you, Ken. Are there any other questions? Do you have anything to add, Mandy? I think we're I don't think so. Okay. So we are up to item nine announcement and uh, some of those were covered probably under the uh, updates for the Friday market review I guess we had talked about and some of the other topics um, and about what's going on in parks and rec yeah were there a uh, bingo there's bingo Saturday yes, bingo uh, yes. yes. <laughs> bingo on Saturday the bingo part um, proceeds will go to the museum which we could really use. And the food and the drinks are being put on by the Juanica ladies. So we're kind of in tandem helping each other out. And so it'll be fun. What time? Right. We're having Starts at six. six. Doors open at six and games usually begin around 6.30. 6.30, Happy family friendly. Pizza. And we're gonna have- um, Dessert, she said. Desserts mm -hmm. like pies. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe some other desserts. Mm -hmm. but How much is it? To it's $10, $10 to play. play. Mm -hmm. Are you the caller? No. I get to be. Yeah, yeah. you have a good calling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know about that, but we'll see. It'll be fun. I can be loud. <laughs> oh, good luck. Oh, I'm jealous. Come with us one day. One day I'll be back. <laughs> or so, 
Is that the end of our announcements? Are there any future agenda items? Did, did you want to talk about our next meeting about um, not the, the frequency of our meetings? Is oh, that... we did talk about that. If you guys wanted to, if you felt like you wanted to stick with monthly, it seems like you have a, a, a good group now. Okay. We were kind of struggling for a while and then staff was kind of struggling because we were just, we had a lot of meetings, um, but I think we've taken some of that off Emily. Um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if 430 still is a good time for you guys or. I think it's a good time. Okay. I just mm -hmm. didn't know about the frequency. Yeah. I think we were, like I said, I think we were just really um, kind of struggling between Emily and I to try and keep up with all the meetings and minutes and, um, you know, everything Finding else. documents. Yeah. Keep a record act request. <laughs> Oh, uh, I got that sheet that has all the meetings, and that's been a game changer for me. Okay, so I'm a lot more prepared to oh, there's be a here on time. A, oh. Yeah, is Jake okay. not on this commission anymore? He is, but I think he could be considered. We should talk with him. Uh, he's missed more than two meetings yeah. in a row at this point. Yeah, so. and I think he's his job now is up in Maple Creek. So it's harder for him to get down here. He was so. hoping to Zoom, and, and yeah. but the yeah we the can't do this. preclude Zooming at this point, except for a dire emergency, and you have to disclose your no location right. and make it open to the public, yeah. even if it's your residence. And if they want to come in, and, and <laughs> I know, right? It's a nice spot. <laughs> Field trip. Yeah, we can touch base with Jake and see what his okay. thoughts are about that. Well, I hope so. I, yeah. I like his yeah his <laughs> ideas. Yes. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of our agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, I will make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second the motion. All in favor, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.